Hi, everybody. You're watching CNN Money Switzerland. I'm Ana Maria Montero, and this summer we are looking at megatrends, in this case, sustainability, and how these have been impacted by the coronavirus. But more importantly, perhaps, how we can leverage the pandemic experience for a more positive future. I'm joined now by René Hoiberger. He is CEO of South Pole. It's a global company specializing in sustainability solutions based here in Switzerland. But Renette, in fact, joins us from Bali, Indonesia today. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, from carbon credits to renewable energy solutions to consulting for global companies, you champion sustainability on both a financial and practical level. So a lot to talk to you about today. But first, I want to hear your thoughts on the effect of the pandemic on the climate crisis. What kind of impact are you seeing? I'm in this business of sustainability and climate since nearly 20 years. And one thing I always observed was some people choked and said, ah, Renat, your business is just for good times. Whenever the economy goes up, people have money to spend on the environment. When the economy goes down, people drop that first thing. And, you know, it was not completely wrong. We had, for instance, the financial crisis. And the financial crisis for a few years really ended the climate debate. But what I see now in COVID, this time is different. In spite of this pandemic, which has sent shockwaves across the economy, what we observe at South Pole is that all our clients stick to their commitments to climate action. And more, we actually have onboarded more clients during the crisis. And you ask, why is that? Why are people in the middle of the pandemics still thinking climate? And I think there is a number of reasons. One of the most important one is people realize global crisis, health crisis, environmental crisis, these topics are linked. And if you are a company which plays long-term, if you're a resilient company, you need to have a strategy to deal with all kinds of crises. And that's why I believe very strongly a lot of boards and CEOs have realized climate action is it's important in the next couple of years. And we have uh, to tackle this uh, issue just as we tackle the COVID crisis. So you don't feel like the coronavirus has served as a distraction from the climate crisis? The virus has been a distraction. And there's a couple of very horrible examples. For example, the deforestation levels in Brazil are up uh, 200% compared to last year, simply because nobody looked at, uh, at climate uh, at the moment. Also, in the background, you might not have even heard about that, but currently we have heat waves north of the polar circle. That has never happened before. And think about all this permafrost all of a sudden uh, melting away. So a couple of really bad things are happening while we are all distracted by COVID. But nonetheless, it is still very interesting to see that uh, we have an increasing amount of companies who in the middle of the crisis still reinforce their climate commitments because they know these crises are linked. And when we now are building back our economy after the crisis, the opportunity is massive to build back the economy in a better way, in a lower carbon way. And this, I'm sure we have to talk about this later on, this creates business opportunities at a scale we have never seen before. And what role does an agreement like the European Union's Green Deal play in this surge of opportunities? That's actually quite an interesting package. It's a policy framework, a vision of making Europe greener. But what I find personally so interesting about it it's not only about a sustainability vision or a climate vision. There's two more elements. The European New Green Deal is also about competitiveness of Europe and it's about equality. Two very big topics. So apparently the European Union is about to say climate action, sustainability action, does not only protect the environment, it also increases the competitiveness of European businesses because they can now offer new technology, forward-looking technology. And on top of that, it helps fighting inequality. Just a small example on that one. If you replace big coal plants with decentralized solar plants, 
automatically you create much more, many more jobs across the entire country instead of only in one place. Just a small example, very obviously renewable energies are more uh, creating more equality on the job side compared to very big fossil fuel plants. So I find interesting that the European Union has understood climate action is at the same time a very big business case. And how confident are you that this Green Deal will go beyond a document that the member states just signed to enacting real change? I mean, to quote my colleague, are we just green wishing here? We have to also be mindful of the benchmark. Let's start with the Paris Agreement. There's a debate whether the Paris Agreement actually is, is meaningful and aggressive or not. But I would start this way. 197 countries have signed the Paris Agreement. That's all countries in the world. I'm talking about countries like Somalia, Syria, North Korea. Everybody has signed the Paris Agreement. When has this happened in the past 10 years? When have global governments agreed on one topic? So I find the message the Paris Agreement is absolutely strong. I think it's the only such agreement that has been signed by everybody, every country in the world. Now you wonder what happened with Paris Agreement. What, so what's the, what's the point now? You know, there it becomes a bit more fuzzy, but I can say at least 77 countries right now have pledged to be net zero emission by 2050. What does net zero emission mean? Net zero emission means that if your country has signed up to this, come 2050, there is no net emission of CO2. So all remaining emissions are also removed from the atmosphere. And that's quite a commitment. All right, let's dig into the carbon offsetting for a minute. Something that's a bit of a sweet spot for you. I mean, you were one of the world's first players in the voluntary carbon market space with My Climate Foundation, and this is something you continue to pursue at South Pole. So tell me, how successful is carbon offsetting as a tool? Offsetting is actually quite effective because what happens is there's so much potential around the world in many countries to reduce emissions that with this additional finance, we can kick off projects that otherwise would not be financeable. Like what? Give me an example. When you reduce 10,000 tons of CO2 by financing efficient cookstoves in Uganda, for example, you are not only taking 10,000 tons of CO2 out of the atmosphere, but you're also supporting a couple of thousand families to cook their food in a much, much cleaner way. That creates health benefits on the ground. It creates benefits whereby women, especially or girls, don't have to walk so far to collect firewood. It saves them time. It has all kinds of additional benefits. And that is exactly the beauty of carbon offsetting. But in terms of mitigation, couldn't carbon offsetting also be seen as a kind of damage control? I mean, by buying carbon credits, you're dodging the need to minimize your own emissions by simply purchasing credits with zero investment in clean or renewable energy projects. So of course, in theory, it would be possible for you to just say, ah, you know, I don't care about emission reductions. I just buy offsets. Now, that is a really bad idea. It doesn't work at all communication wise. Carbon offsetting must always be part of a broader climate strategy that is really uh, from board level, from CEO level, is uh, basically rolled out across the company. Only then do your stakeholders, your shareholders, your employees, your customers, your suppliers actually buy into your commitment. And only then it becomes really powerful. So reduction and offsetting are two sides of the same coin. They always go hand in hand. And what is the advantage for companies to be carbon neutral? I mean, do they see this reflected in the financials or is it just a question of being perceived as socially responsible? So first of all, energy efficiency. You will be more efficient if you understand what's actually going on in your company in terms of carbon emissions. Um, a second point is climate action is really something no company can hide right now. Why is that the case? It's because we all know it. Governments currently in the world are in a difficult position. And more and more customers, employees, especially millennials, look very carefully. What is this company actually doing? Is this company part of the problem or part of the solution? 
So a comprehensive climate strategy is a key differentiator on the market for companies. It's, a, it's, it's good citizenship these days. It's not just a fig leaf and something nice to have. It's a must have, it's a license to operate. The third point I would like to make is the anticipation of stricter laws. If governments are going to net zero by 2050, it will mean that carbon will have a price, a price which is much higher than today. So for companies to already anticipate that, to base that investment decision on carbon intensity is a very good idea because you're anticipating laws that are coming up anyway, and you will have a competitive advantage going forward. And what about carbon pricing? I mean, what role does that play in greening the economy? I have to say, um, I'm surprised. In the last five years, there was a massive uptake of the concept of ESG, for example, like environmental, social, and governments um, uh, indicators for, for the industry. So I think you, you saw the explosion of green bonds, for example. So I would say financial industry is doing all the right things. But we have one problem. Only about 20% of global emissions are actually resulting from listed company, which we can influence. The remaining 80% are caused by private companies, which we cannot influence because they're owned by, uh, by hedge funds, sometimes by governments and so on. So to really capture those emissions, the one thing we actually need is a global price on carbon. And if we cannot get a global price on carbon, at least we need all governments on board to create at least regional and domestic prices on carbon because once the, an emission of a ton of CO2 has a price, this creates level playing field among all industry stakeholders. And all of a sudden, those who are reducing emissions more aggressively will actually make money by doing so. And that, once again, is what carbon offsetting is already anticipating. We are voluntarily putting a price on carbon, anticipating that this is going to be the, the standard in very few years from now. But how do you affront the power of sectors like the oil lobbies, for example? You have to keep in mind there is still <clears throat> about $300 billion every year going into fossil fuel subsidies globally. And it's still a lot of lobbying power, a lot, by the old industry. I mean, here in Indonesia, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's so much uh, lobbying power still going on from people who just make a lot of money by, selling, by digging up and selling coal. And with all the optimism, we should, of course, not close our eyes uh, in front of the reality that uh, globally, there is still a lot of uh, people making money out of fossil fuels. And those people are not giving up so quickly. They have great connections to governments and they will make sure that the old economy is surviving as long as possible. All right, so you said that carbon pricing won't happen yet, but what about carbon schemes? How effective are these? We have a number of schemes that are springing up everywhere, not only in the European Union, but also, for example, in the US, look at California, look at the East Coast. We have Mexico, we have South Africa, Australia, Japan, that are all coming up with their versions of carbon schemes. We have, at the moment, no less than 61 carbon schemes that are currently um, in operation, and many more have been announced. And you could argue that a, a local solution that really looks at the specification of the country are perhaps even more efficient than one global price. But the main story remains the same. Carbon already has a price in many places and will have a price, and a much higher price, in 10 years from now. So it is a great moment to absolutely get ready for a low carbon world. So what are you telling investors? I would tell investors two things. If your company has an important business decision to take, be it around the supply chain, be it around a new factory, be it around the development of new technology, be it around a new office complex, factor in carbon, put a hypothetical price of at least $50, and then run the figures again and see how the different investment alternatives are actually performing. That could be a very smart decision, especially if you're talking about longer term uh, decisions.
The second thing I would, I would tell investors more broadly is that we're actually in an extremely good position. We have the awareness of consumers, of the public, on the climate topic. We have governments who are willing to move, and we do have the technology available. So it's a great moment to shift capital towards the low carbon economy, because already now we can see funds which have been optimized to those topics are already now outperforming their benchmark. So that trend, I believe, is only going to accelerate. Now, as I understand it, at South Pole, you work with a lot of global companies um, and a lot of Swiss-based ones. You've got Nestle, you've got Swiss Re, um, MSC, the shipping company. Um, what kind of interest are you seeing here in Switzerland? The clients across uh, numerous um, areas. Some of the prominent ones, indeed, are those companies which, uh, with a lot of um, uh, client interaction, like Gop Switzerland, Lidl, we recently did a big uh, program with Danone, Volvic Water, um, Galaxus Digitech is another example from Switzerland, the, one of the largest online platforms. The driving force is always the same as we discussed about it. These companies have realized that embracing climate action is great for business. It's what their customers want, it's what the shareholders want, it's what the employees want, and actually, also through efficiency gains and, and other elements, you, you save money by doing that. Now, as I also understand it, you take your clients on a climate journey that allows them to support uh, their choice of projects from around the world. Can you give me some examples of these? One of the examples I can give here is, uh, it's really a cool one we're really proud of. It's with the company Signify, one of the largest uh, producer of efficient lamps. Signify wanted to go carbon neutral, but they said, why wouldn't we use our own technology to do that? So we created this program uh, in India, where in many countries, in many places of India, people still don't have access to re reliable energy uh, and electricity in particular. That means that in the night, people can study, they can't uh, work in the night. So we created this program where we co-financed solar power plants on roofs, which then power efficient lights. And that made such a difference for these communities, which now have, uh, have lights to read and to work. And of course, at the same time, you reduce CO2 because you now get people off the grid in India, which is predominantly powered by coal. So not only do we help the people on the ground, but also we're taking CO2 out, out of the atmosphere. No more coal power. We have now solar power for these villages. And just to finish up, Renat, for somebody who is really fighting a big fight, what keeps you motivated? It is a big problem, yes, but it is absolutely solvable. We have the technology all in our hands. It's all here. We don't even need to research much more. It's just about getting active. You can get better economy plus better environment plus better uh, social cohesion. Actually, these three topics are reinforcing each other. And I think it's absolutely time that we change this narrative. No, it's not true. That's just because we want a safe climate. We have now to stop all activities. It's the opposite. We can absolutely marry a growing economy, a green growing economy with the climate targets. Thank you so much for being with us, Renato. It was a real pleasure.